Okay, well, I wanted to um, preach through something uh, which is, um, I don't want to bite off more than I could chew, basically. And um, I haven't really heard Philemon, Philemon, I can't, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, no, I haven't heard it preached on very, very often, very many times. In fact, I can't recall one time I've ever heard it preached on. Um, And there's not a lot of deep doctrine in there, so I can understand why. But I decided to have a look at it and see if it was worth considering preaching on. And the more I looked at it, the more I was challenged by it. And I thought, well, there's actually loads in here I didn't realize. And so I decided to do that. And it's only one chapter, so um, over the course of a couple of months, I'll be able to preach through the whole book, hopefully, uh, Lord willing. And um, yeah, it's a good good one to start with. And it's it's just a a fascinating book. It's an oft-forgotten miniature book surrounded by hefty and weighty epistles that are well-known and repeatedly preached on. Um, Now, the other one chapter book in the New Testament, Jude, is much better known, I think, than Philemon, much more quoted. I mean, how often do you hear someone quoting Philemon? Um, How how often do you have a memory verse from Philemon? I'm going to go with Philemon, by the way, not Philemon. I'm just... Just so you know, in case it annoys you. Um... Yeah, I wanted to be able to relay simple truths as well in a simple, in a simple way that would be a benefit to me as I prepared it and also to you as you heard it. And like I said, I discovered that Philemon is deeper, more challenging than I, I imagined before. And I found that actually it's actually weighty itself and it's very convicting. Um, it's not actually that easy to preach on because uh, the simple truths that are in it are in fact very uncomfortable. Uh, for me they were anyway. And um, it's a scary thing to preach this chapter openly and faithfully, I could have sort of skirted a few things, and you might want, you might wonder why I'm focusing on the verses that I am, but they just jumped out at me in a way that they haven't before, and I've probably read these sort of introduction verses before in other epistles many times, the same sorts of phrases, and you sort of gloss over them. You go on to the heavier stuff, and Philemon, um, you can't really do that. It's you've got to sort of glean what's there, and it's some amazing stuff. So brace yourselves and hold on tight because this little book's wild. Um, let's read Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus Thou love and faith, thou love and faith, and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again. Thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him for ever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me, therefore, a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord, having confidence in thy obedience. I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But withal, prepare me also a lodging. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, 
Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Amen. So, chapter 1, verse 1, and straight away, Paul, um, within three words, I was really challenged immediately uh, when I started thinking about this, Paul introduced himself as a prisoner. And Ruckman here believes that Paul probably wrote this epistle during his first imprisonment in Rome around AD 62. That's during the reign of Nero. However, it's interesting that Paul does not say a prisoner of Rome or a prisoner of Nero. I found that interesting. I thought today that's how I'd describe myself. You know, they say, oh, I'm at my, what is it, at Her Majesty's pleasure. They say things like that. So he didn't describe himself like that. He described himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And he's effectively saying, for his sake, that's Christ's sake, and his service. And like everything in Paul's life, it was for the sake of Jesus Christ, and being a prisoner for his sake was more important for Paul uh, to write down here than him being an apostle. Paul wasn't coming at Philemon wielding weighty apostolic authority or anything like that. He was imploring him as a friend and as a prisoner, one who was suffering for Christ. And straight from the get-go... Uh, this epistle has a devotional and spiritual tone to it. It's, it's not a weighty thing. Otherwise, Paul would have written Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, which he does in many other places. It's simply a Christian brother and a friend writing earnestly and sincerely and from the heart. I think, in a way, that's how we have to take it. Um, we're not here to dig out huge, great, deep pearls of doctrine. Uh, I'm immediately challenged by the humility of Paul. And by the sincerity which he loved those under his spiritual care. And by his gentleness. Uh, and, and, and him giving the glory to Jesus Christ and everything in his life. Everything that he did, and including being in prison. The glory, Jesus Christ still got the glory. I thought about how I would introduce myself if I was writing a letter to someone. I wonder if you've ever thought the same. Like if you were writing a, a sort of an epistle, if you were writing scripture. I know that's uh, impossible, but you know what I mean. If you're writing to somebody important... If you're writing something weighty, imagine if Theresa May introduced herself as Teresa, a servant of Jesus. Instead, her official title is the Right Honourable Theresa May MP. It's quite an incredible thing that everyone in this world is seeking our title or MA, BA, BSc, MSc, Doctor, what is it, Professor, all these different titles you can have. But how about identifying ourselves as our, by our purpose for Jesus Christ? That's what Paul was doing. His purpose at the time was to be a prisoner for Jesus Christ, so that's how he identified himself. I just, I just thought that was quite significant. You know, all, all that we are at the end of the day is Christ, and any good in us is Christ, and all of our purpose should be completely wrapped up in Christ. And that's why Paul identified himself like that. Um, yet we're brilliant at seeking glory and honour and accolades and all this worldly junk and it puffs us up and massages our egos and it's simply, in my opinion, backward thinking. Back to the world we go far too often. We forget where we shall spend eternity in heaven and whom we shall serve for all eternity. Um, For in him we exist and we will exist and yet we forget that and we seek a crown in this world. It doesn't make any sense. The more I think about worldly titles and then compare it to people like Paul the Apostle and the way he would introduce himself and how he would hold himself, I just think I, it's complete nonsense seeking all that stuff. Imagine getting an OBE, going to meet the Queen and getting your title that you can put some letters on the end of your name. It doesn't really mean anything. Even when in other books Paul introduced himself as Paul the Apostle, like I said, he gives the glory every time to Jesus Christ even when he has to use his official capacity. It's a small example of how we should live our lives, I think, constantly aware of our purpose in Christ. And if you're wondering what that is, it's to serve. Have a look at uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, 
acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Reasonable service was this phrase which really stood out there. Paul identifying himself, his role right then as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And that got me thinking, well, what's my role? I'm a servant. And that's what your role is as well if you profess the name of Jesus Christ and call him your Lord. And you're a servant too. And you, you have a reasonable service. That is your lot in life now, to be a servant of God. It's higher than any worldly calling. Although your flesh, and this is where these titles come in, they appeal to the flesh like a carrot dangling in front on the stick, dangling in front of you. Your flesh doesn't want you to think that. Your flesh wants you to think that those things are worth attaining. But you already have the highest title. You're a servant of the Most High. It doesn't get any better than that. And Paul had come to terms with that. But I don't make, meet many people who have. Even Christians and Christian families I know, they're, obsessed, they're still obsessed with worldly attainment and achievement. Um, I, just, I know it's only a little phrase, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, but I thought there was a lot in that. He'd introduce himself like that. He's trying to get um, Philemon to do something that he wants him to do. So he could have introduced Paul the Apostle, the chiefest of apostles, the apostles of the Gentiles. He could have said something like that, couldn't he? But he didn't. came in very humbly. Then you get four titles or four ways of address, four means of address. He says, our brother, talk about Timothy, and says, dearly beloved, fellow laborer, and fellow soldier. Four different titles that he's addressing people with. And again, I, uh, what, again, I would usually just gloss over those. I'd read through the introduction of a, of a book and not really spend much time on them, but I started thinking about how he addressed those people. And can you imagine Paul the Apostle addressing you as that, a fellow soldier? Imagine how that would make you feel. It would give you some confidence in serving the Lord. As, a, as Christians are aware of our purpose in Christ. You know, we should be also be aware of our purpose in Christ's body. And this is the theme running through the whole core of Philemon. It's like a, this shocking love, this shocking level of love that the world doesn't know, that goes against the world's logic, but is based instead on who we are in Christ. So the question I was asking myself is, do I love the church? And I was reading this, and the way Paul was addressing these, these people, you know, dearly beloved, fellow laborer, fellow soldier, our beloved <coughs> Aphia, I asked myself the question, do I love the church? And it's easy to dismiss that question almost and say, oh yeah, of course I do, yeah. Or do you see yourself as a lone wolf, a Rambo-type freedom fighter for God? I think a lot of, um, sort of people in our sort of circle see themselves as that. Lone wolf freedom fighter, but Paul, he was looking for fellow laborers, fellow soldiers, and it meant a lot to him. At the end of the day, I think we have a difficult time being 21st century Christians because we're from a society which is very worldly, materialistic, and self-seeking, self-centered. There are other cultures in the world which are based on sharing and family. I don't know what it was like back in Romania, but... Um, you know, this country is not like that really anymore. It's very individualistic. And that's difficult then when you get saved, when you become a Christian, you become part of the body of Christ, how you then relate, how you then start living as if you're a part of a family again. Um, I asked myself this question, I asked myself whether I was concerned only for my family. Was I concerned for other people's families in the church, other people in the church, their families, when I hear that they're sick? Was I concerned only for my own prosperity? You'll like this one. My own belly. My own health. My own walk with God. It can be really spiritual. Just totally focused on your own walk with God. Not bother about anyone else's. You don't truly understand your place in the church if that's true of you. That's what I told myself. And like I said, this is a, it's kind of hard one to preach really when I started thinking about this stuff. Paul's identity was so invested in Christ. And this is really key here. That like Christ, he cared deeply for the church. You can't really be Christ-like without caring for the church because that that's what Christ, Christ did. In fact, Paul even admitted it was the only reason he had any interest in hanging around in this world. Have a look at Philippians chapter 1. 
Philippians chapter 1, verse 23 and 26. Philippians 1, 23 and 26 to 26. This is quite a confession from Paul. He says, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, and nevertheless to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. He didn't still have thing, he didn't have a bucket list. Oh, I still haven't seen the Grand Canyon. I still haven't traveled around the world in a hot air balloon. I still haven't <coughs> deep sea dived. I haven't, I, still, I haven't visited the North Pole. You know, he, he wanted to stay on earth because for the benefit of the church. I don't, I can't ever remember thinking like that. Shocking really, but I can't remember thinking like that. I'm needed. I, I, I want to stay here to bless other Christians. But it really challenged, I think, my own selfishness. Just the way he was addressing these people. Now, Paul's Paul's life was totally invested in the furtherance of the church. He lived in prison. You got you think about him living in prison. You can imagine him longing for news on how the churches he nurtured were faring. You know that's what was on his mind. You know that was his chief desire. How his friends and his brothers in the Lord were coping with the trials and tribulations of this world. He wanted to know. Now here are some examples of Paul's heart being warmed and filled with joy due to his deep love for the church. Have a look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 verse 7 and 8. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, there's that word again, beloved, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Beloved of God, Paul recognizes that it's significant and that these people are also dearly beloved of Paul. You know, Paul, think, Paul thanks God for them. Uh, it just made me ask the question, do we thank God for each other? Do we really thank God for each other? It literally warmed Paul's heart. You can tell that the way he's writing that news of how other saints were doing warmed his heart. Have a look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love in which ye have to all the saints. There is Paul giving thanks again. He's relentless uh, with his prayers of thanks to the saints. And why is he thankful? Because of their love for the other saints. <laughs> Clearly, real love between Christians is a valuable thing. A real concern and genuine deep care. And the final one of these little examples. Have a look at Philippians Chapter 1, from verse 3. Philippians chapter 1, from verse 3. Paul says, I thank my God uh, upon every remembrance of you. Isn't that an amazing statement? Always, in every prayer of mine, for you all making request with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which abide Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. There's so much in that, so many examples of his compassion and care for the church. It's an incredible example of Paul's love. He's given thanks to them, it's a joy for him, he desires their love to abound, 
But what about our love? Now what does God want us to do with it? The day of Christ, Paul talks about here, Paul knows it's coming. And he wants it to be a good day for all those under his care. And to put it simply, Paul was devoted. You might well think that Paul was only devoted because he was the apostle to the Gentiles. And surely our devotion does not have to be quite so intense, right? Because we're not the apostles of the Gentiles. Perhaps only half the sincerity of Paul. Would that be enough? Half as seriously as he took it? Care for the church? Love for other Christians? Or about a quarter? Probably get away with that. And still feel good about ourselves. Well, let's have a look what Jesus, Jesus Christ himself had to say about that. Have a look at John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If you have love one to another. Do you identify as a disciple of Christ? Not if you don't love other believers. If Christ loved you, you don't. According to Jesus. I mean, that's brutally harsh. But At least not to the world looking in. How can they identify as you, you as a, the true disciple of Jesus Christ if you don't love other brothers and sisters in Christ as Christ loved you? That one hit me hard. It's obvious why Paul cared so much though, isn't it? Because Jesus cared so much. That is also why we should care so much. And clearly, according to Jesus, we have the same obligation of care and love towards our fellow disciples. Are you going to object on the basis that Jesus was talking to his 12 disciples? Not necessarily to the church. Well, let's have a look what Peter the Apostle had to say then. In Second Peter... Chapter 1, 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 7 to 10. He's going through his list. I didn't put the whole list in. He says, and, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren, nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the flip side. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fail. You better take this seriously, unless you want to be completely blind spiritually. We must have brotherly brotherly um, kindness and charity you must have it so how about Paul the Apostle what did he himself have to say about it well you don't need to turn there it's very short but in Hebrews 13 1 we read let brotherly love continue so Paul wasn't just concerned for the church himself he wanted his churches to be concerned for each other and Christians to love each other continually. Let it continue. But turn, if you will, to back to the book of Philippians. <coughs> chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 1 to 4. Paul says this. <clears throat> if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love. He's talking in definitive terms here, folks. If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And that, folks, is a knockout blow to the self-centered Western and worldly Christianity that is pandemic of our culture. 
When Paul said back in Philemon, dearly beloved, you can see from that example in Philippians, he really meant that. You can see from the example that Jesus set in John 13, Paul really meant that. It wasn't just an attempt at buttering Philemon up to agree to his request. He really saw him as a fellow laborer. That's amazing. And Paul wanted the very best for him. And Paul knew that this situation with Onesimus could help him achieve that. He described others in the church, uh, there with Philemon, as fellow soldiers. Don't forget who Paul was. He didn't pull rank. And he might as well have, because for all intents and purposes, he's a general. They were effectively um, serving, serving under Paul, weren't they? He was instructing them, but he called them fellow soldiers. I've got to ask, you've got to ask yourself a question. Do, you, do we speak out, do we, sorry, do we seek out special positions of privilege? Uh, do we seek a higher rank? Do we wish to lord it over other Christians? Could we have that sort of, Paul was able to wield authority without lording it over other Christians. It was an amazing thing, really. Probably the most, well, he is the most important church age Christian of all time. And he addressed those around him as fellow soldiers. I've been in churches and met other pastors and things like that who um, have a real pastor complex. They have a real dictatorial spirit. And um, my time in America and, uh, well, not really America, more Canada, was a real eye-opener. One particular church there where if the pastor said jump, you ask how high. And it was really intense. And you got the feeling that uh, this sort of attitude, this sort of spirit that Paul had was completely lost. We've got to be very careful about that. So what about our love? Do we really love everyone dearly in this church? How about the saved outside of this church who followed erroneous doctrinal paths? I'm not saying you have to be in this church not to have followed an erroneous doctrinal path, but you know what I'm saying. The churches which cause us grief just to think about and upsets us. Do we long to see them restored to fellowship with the God of truth? You know, Paul would have. He'd have written them an epistle. And he would have said things like, see through these tears that I write, the tear-stained pages that he was writing to them. I mean, this is an interesting question. Do you truly fear for other churches and other Christians on Judgment Day as if it was your own? Because I got the feeling that Paul did. He really feared for other Christians as if it was his own Judgment Day. That's why he said he would trade places. Uh, I can't remember, it's just off the top of my head. But he said uh, he would trade places with uh, Jewish, believer, Jewish unbelievers if he could. Incredible statement. Are you filled with scorn? towards those caught up in the liberal modern church movements. I've, I've been in the past, even in the last 24 hours probably. Or does your heart break for them? And where are the tears that should be streaming down our faces? And where, where are we pleading with the Lord for, for the repentance of these brothers and sisters? I know some of them aren't brothers and sisters. Some of them aren't saved. Some of them are sort of posturing. I know that. But many of them are. and they, They're brothers and sisters dearly beloved who've strayed into stormy waters which is a tragedy and not something to scorn at but sometimes I I fall into that trap I fear that many times I've gotten this all wrong dearly beloved is the attitude to have to have to have the, the Lord empty you of so many selfish desires that you can honestly say that about other people is incredible they are redeemed like us in the blood of the Lamb. And I want that attitude. I do. I was thinking about it this week. I spent a lot of time thinking about it and yesterday uh, night, last night particularly. And I thought it will really cost to have that attitude. It will cost all, all of us. You really have to wave goodbye to self-centeredness. And it's when you read passages like this and see the way Paul was addressing um, Philemon and... and you really focus on it, you start to realise your own attitude, how you would address it, how you would start it. You, it just got me thinking. How can we look at all those who have surrounded themselves with all manner of nonsense, as we know they have, all manner of doctrinal nonsense and chaos and craziness, how can we look at them as beloved? Beloved. It's a hard thing to do. 
What we can't do is pray to God like the Pharisee in Luke 18. Have a look at this guy for an example of what not to do. Luke chapter 18, verse 11. This is the wrong attitude to have towards the church. Luke chapter 18, verse 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I know it's a different context. It's a good example of of the self-righteous attitude that can be very easy to fall into. Because we think we've got our doctrine right. Shouldn't be self-righteous about that. Do we have the attitude of Paul who kept laboring fervently to try and right the wrongs that were creeping into the body of Christ, even in his day? And yes, sometimes you use stern language. I'm not saying that it's some wishy-washy love. Sometimes you use stern language, but it was in love. Sometimes he rebuked, but it was also always in love. And he always, always prayed, and he always pleaded, and he always sought the Lord on behalf of the church. Sometimes I feel like in my heart I've given up on it. I'm done with the church, the wider church. But Paul wasn't done spiritually with them. Now, moving on to verse 4. <laughs> Again, a simple statement, one which we read loads of times in the New Testament, but I spent some time dwelling on it, instead of skimming over it as I usually would. I'm just being honest. I I thank my God, making mention of the always in my prayers. So this is just a bit more specific along the same lines, but a bit more specific now about prayer. And I thought it's actually a good point. A simple place to start caring and loving more about these other churches is, is just by praying. And keep praying for each other, first of all, in our own church, in all areas of each other's lives. It's, I think men find it more difficult than women to have consistent prayer lives. We're very, men are like islands, and it's hard to open up. And, but we should be praying all the time for each other's lives. Everyone in this church should be praying for everyone else in this church regularly and, and deeply caring. We're not just coming here for show. We should pray for each other's lukewarm families. And for the other churches in our own town. Where are we? Kidderminster, Starport, um, Harborn. Should know the churches in that town. Not necessarily even on a personal level, but just know of them and pray for them. And not that they would be warm and cozy and keep carrying on their descent into madness that they are on. But praying for them. Even if we think there's no hope, oh, they're never going to turn around, there's, they're never going to change their minds, that Paul wouldn't have given up, he would have still been praying through tears. Pray for the other Bible believers that we know around the world. Pray for the Christians around the world that have fallen into error and be burdened for them and plead for them. Just because we are to be separate from the great falling away, which we are to be, this isn't, ec- this isn't ecumenical to pray for the Christians. Just because we're to be separate from the great falling away doesn't mean we can't pray for the Christians still entangled in it. We've said before how you can even possibly be saved within a Jehovah's Witness church. Still part of the congregation. I think they need prayer more than any other Christian on the planet, don't they? The ones stuck in Catholicism, the ones stuck in um, Jehovah's Witness um, churches, if you can call them that. Kingdom halls. But we need to remember our own state in Christ. That's another thing that helps us to keep in mind the, the right context for these other Christians. Remember our own state in Christ. And don't be so foolish as to rate yourself so highly that you can't bring yourself low enough to pray for the troubled churches, which are tiny penny today. We're just talking about Methodism, Anglicanism, absolute tragedy what's happened. And it was the late, great Robert Murray McShane of Scotland who said, Oh, what a black soul wast thou when Christ set his love upon thee. We shouldn't forget that. Pride and selfishness is the reason we say in the most secret corners of our hearts, I will not pray for them. I can't be bothered. I don't like them so they can do one. Why should I care for them if they don't care for me? And I have better things to do with my time. The little I do pray is all about me. 
I have better things to do with my time. Isn't that a common thing? Where do we find the time to pray for other churches? Where do we find the time? We've got enough to worry about. We've got enough on our plates. We shouldn't be concerned about them. But I, I know Paul was Paul was broken hearted for churches that were spying out control. Look at his approach to the Galatians. Look at his approach to the uh, Corinthians. These were like apostate churches, man. The stuff they were bringing in, what the Galatians were teaching, we, they would be dismissed on YouTube as all unsaved, all lost, and all going to hell. <laughs> Paul didn't, Paul didn't abandon them to that. In this very same sermon that McShane said, the previous quote, he said this of love and sacrifice. He said, love is known by the sacrifice it will make. If you will sacrifice nothing, you love not. That's so true, isn't it? Because how do you know that God loved you? Have a look at 1 John 4. 1 John chapter 4. Verse 8 to 11. One John four, eight to eleven. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that he sent that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. I think it's about time that we lay down our, and I, like I said, I, I'm, my, I am front and center in my mind's eye when I say this, uh, but it's about time we lay down our ridiculous pride and our selfish ego. And it's about time we start pleading with God, not only for our own sanctification, but also for that of our fellow Christians, our fellow saints, our fellow partakers, fellow partakers of true election. They are elected with us to eternal life. Actually, that word's really important here. Calvinists have hijacked that word. But that word's really important here. They're elected with us to eternal life. That's amazing. And that means everything, because we're no better than them. They were no better than us. And the same Lord who loved us, loved them also. And Paul knew this. And so he prayed always for the other saints and churches. And he viewed himself as a fellow, fellow laborer, fellow soldier. And he made himself exist only for the purpose of serving Christ. And therefore, he didn't have any ego to deal with. He wasn't just thinking about himself. He was totally sold out on serving Christ by trying to look after, by ministering to the church. He was free to love the church. And I think the things that we clog our hearts up with stop us from looking beyond our own borders. There's the Apostle John who said, uh, we, we ought also to love one another. Right here in 1 John 4. We ought also to love one another. You can have all the doctrine you want. And we should be very concerned about having good doctrine. If you get into all sorts of hassle and mess. But if you and I don't learn the teacher, who is Jesus, we don't learn him, we'll never truly understand, understand the subject. You've got to have the characteristics to put it into proper practice. The teacher is Jesus Christ. He is the master. He is the ultimate example. And by learning him, we will learn to view ourselves in our true context. Now, everything we have looked at um, in these simple verses in Philemon is far less about viewing others in their true context and more about viewing ourselves in ours. Once you've achieved that, then it's pretty natural to follow Paul's example here. Because we'll be walking in the Spirit of God, which is what Christ intended for us, and not rotting in our own flesh. Once you've achieved that, once you can understand your true context, then when you look at other people, look at other Christians, look at other churches, you're not looking down from your ivory tower. It's not about building ivory tower for ourselves. It's about digging a grave for our flesh. Then you can understand, then you can understand how God will want you to relate to them. What God might want you to pray about them. There's a warning that comes with this as well. And it's something we've, again, we've all discussed this a lot recently. Most of the time when we find 
when we find things like this, and you often find things like this spoken about, you find people who seem to be very concerned and care for the church, there is a danger of strain into false humility. You can't put this on externally. It has to be a heartfelt concern. Not just a, I'm praying for you, brother, but you don't really care. Usually there's a hidden motive behind people like that. We've said before how most people call you brother. Uh, some of them have a hidden motive, an agenda. It doesn't mean you shouldn't. It just means that you've got to be very careful what your motive is. It's not a pharisaical, external thing. There's nothing more disappointing than someone who pretending to love you, pretending to care for you, and they turn out just to be really selfish. Nothing more disappointing than that. You don't want to be that disappointment. It's a great shame, and it certainly, I think, has had a hardening effect on us. Because we don't want to appear the same way, but in another sense, we don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater either, either, because otherwise we'll slowly form into many Pharisees, and we'll construct ivory towers for ourselves. And, you know, once upon a time, these things probably started out as genuine disappointments. Disappointments with the way the modern church is going. Even disappointments with each other. Something I've said to you, something you've said to me, we let it fester into bitterness and so we don't, we don't pray for each other. I'm not, we don't really like them. But on face value, I pretend that we pretend that we do. And it's the selfishness, these selfish corners of our hearts that cause this. The spirit of the Pharisees is far too easily adopted. And we must be on our guard against it. It'll stop us loving. It'll stop us seeing ourselves what we truly are. And as Peter said, we'll become blind. Instead, we must conform to the master who humbled himself enough to die for us. That's the example. We've got to consent daily to our death in Christ. I heard that from a pastor once. I thought it was a good quote. Consent daily to your death in Christ. The flesh needs to be put to death. <clears throat> Back in Philemon, the last verse I was going to look at today. Oh, Philemon. Verse 5. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. God in heaven knows our love and our faith and he hears of it and even the most secret parts of our hearts are not hid from him. He knows our wrong thoughts about our brothers and sisters and even in the last 24 hours I'm sure we can think of specific thoughts or things we've said and done against the body of Christ. That's amazing, isn't it? To think that we ourselves have even attacked the body of Christ which are born out of selfish pride not out of a sincere and selfless love for the church. How can this be? How can we get it so catastrophically wrong? How can we be so puffed up and full of pride and not even realize it? Which usually prideful things, you, after the event, you realize how prideful you were. And at the time, you weren't even aware of it. We're no more deserving of God's grace and mercy than anyone in the, in the church. No more deserving of God's grace and mercy than some of the classics. You know, the Rick Warrens, the Joel Olsteins, the uh, Kenneth Copelands, the Benny Hinn's. We don't know, almost certainly um, we think that the majority of those people aren't saved. We don't know. But we're still no more deserving of God's love. This isn't Calvinism. <laughs> we haven't been specially selected. We've been elected because we put our faith in Jesus. Has God honestly heard of our love, which we have towards all saints? Because here, Paul had heard of the love that Philemon had towards all saints. But has God heard of our love towards all saints? Do his angels report to him how faithful we are in loving our brothers and sisters and praying for them? Does it even exist? And to think that he weighs every thought and action and knows its true intent. We can't pull all over his eyes. See, the truth is, we're on the brink of the rapture. And thereafter the great tribulation will engulf this world that is coming. And the churches are in dire disarray. And we as Christians are under increasing pressure to conform with the liberalism, wicked liberalism, and the sinful lust of this world. We ought to be always making mention in our prayers for the protection of the church. We ought to be praying for every Christian we know, that God would strengthen them and protect them at this critical time in history. Love for the Lord Jesus should translate to love for his bride, love for the church. There is no way to wriggle out of this. 
you read the introduction to any of Paul's letters and you find the same thing. You can't get away from it. Even the hyper, hyper dispensationalists can't get away from it because it's all, all of Paul. You can't just brush it under the rug, pretend it isn't intrinsic to New Testament doctrine to be deeply moved for the plight of the church. And by that I mean move to prayer. And maybe even tears. It's easier for some people to cry than others, but Paul certainly cried real tears for the church. Not crocodile ones either. Not fake humility. This is about relationship, this passage, not theology. I'm pretty convinced of that. The undertones, the thread of this passage is all about relationship. Regardless of our place in history, a strong and close relationship with Jesus Christ is what is needed. Demands Christ demands love for his church. You can't get around that. And that's what I realised when I started looking deeper at these verses of what I thought was going to be a very simple book. I realised I put myself in checkmate because you can't preach, you can't, I could skim over them and go straight into the story of Philemon and Onesimus, but there was something in these verses that I hadn't really dwelt on before. And I can't wriggle out of it. And um, I know I have to do more to be less selfish and a lot more to be less selfish in my heart and in my mind. We're purposed to serve God on this earth and part of that service is to love the church and each other as brothers and sisters be selfless and caring. A pastor once told me that love changes the nature of service from a duty into a delight. That's why Paul was able to say, the word joy all the time and dearly beloved it really was a joy to him to hear of good things that the church was doing and my honestly I find myself indifferent a lot of the time and uh, I realised there was such a gap it's not a poor uh, sorry it's not a chore for Paul to love the church it was a joy look at the way he talks to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 2 Timothy chapter 1 Verse 2 to 5. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ our Lord, Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers, night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am also persuaded that in thee also. So night and day, Paul is praising God, thanking God for, for Timothy's faith. Do you feel like that about any of your other brothers and sisters' faith? That you're overwhelmed with joy or you're indifferent to it? I don't know, it's just... It just seemed to me there's such a disconnect, it needed to be pointed out, I don't know. I had to point it out to myself. It's Paul's joy to see Christians grow closer to the Lord. It's not a competition between him and Timothy to see who can attain the most power, as you see in some churches. Power struggles. And what a nonsense that is. <laughs> it's not flattery from Paul's lips. He's not trying to make, become more favourable to Timothy, so he's given it, you know, great swelling words. It's not that. It really is love that drives Paul. You know, sometimes I think that Bible believers unite over common enemies. I don't know if that makes sense. We unite over common enemies. And that's sometimes what draws us together. And you get what I'm saying by that. We're against this, so naturally you think we fit together. But I'm going to be honest now. I haven't found many Christians in this world who want to unite with me out of a love for Christ. i found some. And I'm trying to gravitate in my life towards the ones that do. Hence, we moved halfway across the country. I've been very disappointed in a lot of places I've gone and, and with the attitudes I've found. That should grieve me rather than make me just want to condemn. I haven't found many Bible believers who want to unite with me over a common love for the church either. Out of a desire to pray for the churches that are sliding into the doctrinal abyss, that are embracing the world rather than the word of God, it's a pray in earnest with me about that. But then I have to hold my hand up and say, I haven't been a Christian willing to do that often enough either. So the book does stop with me on that one. 
Do you think that just because we are believing, Bible believing Christians that God needs us? We have to remember that. Now, the reality is that even the Pharisees thought that God needed them. In Matthew 3 9, you'd have to turn there, they talked about being of the lineage of Abraham. God didn't need them because then he told them he could raise up <laughs> followers from the stones. Didn't need the Pharisees just because they were descended from Abraham. Just because we have the perfect Bible. He doesn't need us. If we're not humble in light of our struggling brothers and sisters, if we're not grieved, if we choose to be self-righteous and indignant, we'll deny the very Christ that bought us. As an apostle, Paul viewed other Christians and churches as his life work. They were his living epistles. Again, I have to turn there for time. It's 2 Corinthians 3, verse 1 to 3. He literally says that. He says that to the Corinthians. You are our epistle. Living epistle. That was the work, his life's work. That was what he was invested in. And granted, we're not apostles in the sense that Paul was. But we do have an opportunity to impact the ever-weakening church for the Lord's glory. To Paul, he put everything into their spiritual health. He loved those early churches tremendously. And without love, we'll simply become gainsayers and Pharisees. And there's too many of them around you. Like I said, just go on YouTube, you'll find plenty of them. Gainsayers, Pharisees. Oh, I've given up on YouTube. <laughs> I know I can't give up on the church, but I've given up on YouTube. It's a minefield. The world, the world has no idea what type of love this is we're talking about. got no idea. The news today is full of the world's attempts to be nice and loving. But it's rubbish, isn't it? The pride festivals, all this stuff. Being nice, not offending people. They've got no idea what kind of love Paul was talking about here. Crying with tears through the night for the spiritual health, for the well-being of his brothers and sisters in Christ. Incredible. And Jesus said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. I'm not trying to tell you how to live, by the way. I'm looking plainly at these few verses at the beginning of Philemon, and I'm seeing a clear example of a man who has learnt to die in Christ, who's become like his master, a true disciple, an overwhelming difference between him and most Christians is that he loves and derives joy from the success of the church he loves, and he lives for that joy. Most Christians don't. Paul truly was a crucified Christian, wasn't he? Usually what happens with these incredible intros to Paul's letters is they get skipped over. But they're so rich devotionally speaking. You see a, it's like an actual pattern, an example of a life really lived for Christ. And you see little glimpses of it. We shouldn't skip over them. They're actually so rich. I can't believe how convicting this small uh, group of sort of never quoted verses actually is. It reminds me ultimately that the Bible is at the believer's mercy. We get from it what we choose to get from it. If you skim these verses and focus only on little intricacies of doctrine, uh, which are important, but ultimately you'll have done yourself a tremendous disservice. Few in the church today want to be as invested as Paul. And I think if we cherish the message of Jesus Christ to love each other, we'll cherish the church. And like I said already, I'm not talking about the wishy-washy love, it's not an Anglican version of love, you know. Sometimes Jesus was really harsh when he needed to be. But if we truly love Christ, we'll truly love the church. We're not at war with the churches around us, even though sometimes they may think they will, they sort of want to be at war with us or shun us or put, we're not at war with them. They've chosen to walk a very different path. None of this will happen if we cannot understand our true purpose in Christ though. I think that's the, the underlying thing I want to finish with. Pride creeps in so fast and it blinds the heart and it spreads selfishness. And what this really made me do is examine why I don't feel like this. Why I don't view people as dearly beloved. But I have, I'm have i fond of them. I know, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not like I'm hating all my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm fond of them. But I don't have this depth of love that Paul had. Said to Timothy, greatly desiring to see thee. That would fill him with joy. To truly love the church, we have to do some serious pruning and weeding in our hearts. There's the selfish things that we've got to go. Paul, I can't even, I can't kind of put it into words to the, the scale to which Paul was invested in other Christians. 
But hopefully I've done it some, some kind of justice and trying to explain that. It hit me for six. And it was rough preparing, preparing this message. It really challenged me. I was, I was nervous to preach it, to be honest, because of my own shortcomings. It's a difficult thing to preach something you know you're failing at. I'm not even sure whether you should. In a way, I wanted to say to John, maybe I'm not ready to be preaching because I realize how far I'm falling short of this, but I just think it needed to be said. I've got a lot more to do. And there's so much more that could be said, but I hope that's enough to get the ball rolling. And uh, Amen.